October 27th, four days later, October 31, they found his body at the Gladstone Hotel. Four days. Yeah, four days. He fought every major heavyweight boxer in the days when boxing was still a respected sport, and he was never knocked off his feet. Muhammad Ali called him one of the toughest guys he'd ever come up against. But Canada's heavyweight boxing champion fought his toughest battle in his private life. We met George Chivalo at Huff Gym in Mississauga. George, I, I uh, read a comment from you once when you were talking about your childhood and that you'd wanted to be a fighter from a very early age. You wanted to be a fighter. You wanted to, you wanted to fashion yourself, you said, like a young Joe Lewis. Where did that come from in you? Well, I don't know where it really came from, ex except I know when it happened. Yeah. When I was seven years old, I went into a cigar store. It was called Morgan Cigar Store in the junction where I was brought up. Kiel Dundas is the hub of the junction. And uh, I went into a place called Morgan Cigar Store, which was more like a convenience store, but it called itself a cigar store. They sold cigars and cigarettes and so on, and the confectionaries, and, you know, and uh, had a, they had a magazine rack. And I remember looking at the magazine rack, and I saw a boxing magazine called uh, The Ring, called itself The Bible of Boxing, as right. it does today. Yeah. yeah. It's the longest boxing magazine, uh, uh, in, you know, in, in history, so to speak. <laughs> it's been there for, you know, decades and decades. Anyway, uh, I look at the... I look up the pictures inside, open it up, I see all these guys with muscles, so I said, that's for me. I'm seven years old. I run home, I say, Mom, Mom, give me a set of boxing gloves. I want to be a fighter. She said, oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, took her a couple of years to get a set. She got them from uh, Eaton's. She had a, kind of a very uh, a beigey colored ba uh, paper bag and uh, got a set of gloves, four gloves. And uh, I went and got some of my buddies. And I went diagonally across the street, up a laneway, and into the unpaved parking lot of Lancia Macaroni Pasta Factory. <laughs> and we used to go to what we called the uh, Macaroni Field, really the unpaved parking lot. Okay. And I'd go there and I'd box with my buddies. And, uh, and I used to uh, read the sporting cards in Wheaties Breakfast of Champions cereal. We used to have these cereal boxes with these sporting cards in there, and there could be tips on baseball, hockey, football, uh, basketball, whatever, and boxing. And uh, the boxing tips uh, were primarily by uh, Joe Lewis, who was the heavyweight champion, reigning champion at the time. And like I said, I was boxing with the guys in the, uh, at the macaroni field, and like I said earlier, I had a, I had a bit of an advantage because I would read some of the tips. And one of them was, you throw a jab to the body, uh, and next time you throw, pretend you throw a jab, you just fade it let it go out a few inches, and the guy goes to block it, and he drops his hand down like this, and you throw a left hook to the head. So there were a few little things like that. Okay. <laughs> and so I would do pretty good. So one day a guy says to me, George, he's, he's an older guy. When I say older, probably 17 or 18. Right. He said to me, George, you're pretty good at what you do, so why don't you go to a gym? I said, where's their gym? He said, at St. Mary's Polish Roman Catholic Church, about a mile away. So that's where I go. I went to the church. They had a gym in the, in the basement, and they used to have a tr training there every day of the week. And on Saturdays, they also had dancing. And uh, I remember when the new priest came in from Winnipeg, he said, Catholics don't dance and they don't fight. So <laughs> no dancing, no, no, uh, no fighting. No Catholics so don't dance a, and they don't uh, fight. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, anyway... Maybe that's why I never danced much in the ring. I, I should have learned how to dance the, at the dance a little better. Be were you a skinny long. kid at this point? Or were I you... Know, uh, well, I know my first fight was at the age of 10. Yeah. I weighed 85 pounds. I think that's pretty normal, I think. I guess. Yeah, then I remember at 12, I was 112. I, just, I, I don't know how I remember these things. <laughs> And I remember that I weighed myself with my clothes on. I had a corduroy jacket. I was 14. I was 172 with my clothes on. At 15, I was 198. And I stayed around that weight for a couple of years. You were 198 at, at the age of 15. Yeah. You put a lot of weight on over a short period of time, you said. Well, you put on like yeah. 70, 70 pounds over a period. I did, I did push-ups to, I mean, I, I, didn't really, I, I did them like all day long, all night long. It seemed like I could do, I remember at the age of 12, I could only do, at that time, only four push-ups. Six months later, I could do 400 with my feet on, the, on a, a chair and, doing, and going down 
past two other chairs, whatever the, it would be at yeah. this level, I go right past the, the, the chair. 400. I could do 400. I was like maniacal. Okay? <laughs> I remember my mother waking up around 1 or 2 in the morning. I'd be in the sunroom uh, upstairs doing the push-ups, and I guess I'm making some kind of strange noises as I'm grinding out the 400. And Joe, Joe, what are you doing? Are you okay? <laughs> she didn't know what was, you know, what was going on. No, 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 it's okay. I'm just doing some push-ups. And I'd, and I'd be like, I'd be so uh, uh, into training, so into trying to develop my body, so into wanting to be strong, you know. And that was the initial thing. Not so much that I want to be a fighter, so much as being, I think, being strong. Yeah. And being, uh, being able to, I guess, handle myself naturally. You know, I mean, you know, you know when you read the boxing books and you read and, and you want to be developed. And but, but and it, what attracted me the most was the guys who looked so fit, they looked so yeah. ready, and they looked uh, looked like the way I wanted to look. When you took the uh, the Canadian Amateur Championship in '55, you, your record was 16 0 and 0. Yeah. And they were all, all 16 were knockouts in the first four rounds. Is that right? Well, they only, had, they only had three round fights. So okay. they, well, excuse me, three three minute rounds and five two minute rounds. I see. So okay. All right. You know, sometimes you're fighting five, right. sometimes you're fighting three. Yeah. But 16 I, and 0. I mean, yeah, something like know. that. I don't. I don't remember my real record in the. Uh, there's a few. There were a few extra fights in there, so I had about 19 fights or so. Okay. But I couldn't. The trouble with being a heavyweight in those days in Toronto was there were very little action, there were very okay. few heavyweights fighting. So we used to fight the Palace Pier, East York Arena, Palace Pier, and they used to, and CBC televised the fights, and they would show your fight the following week. If, you know, you fight one night, and they would they would tape it and show it the following week. You see yourself on TV, it was pretty cool stuff back yeah. in the early 50s. Anyway, cool for me, anyway. Uh, and, uh, but when it came to fighting a lot of fights were very tough to find. I won the Canadian Championship when I was uh, 17 on May the 7th, 1955. Uh, I was still in high school, and uh, that was it. My, my my career kind of stopped, you know, as yeah. far as getting fights. Today, when you're a champion of Canada and uh, in any given division, they'll send you to countries all over the world. There's yeah. all kinds of tournaments, all kinds of competition. But back then, and, there but, was none of that. Yeah, and yeah. in those days, the, the government would pay you money to get in shape for the Olympics and stuff like that. But in those days, it, it, boxing wasn't as important. They would only send four guys out of ten divisions to the Olympics. Yeah. And I was the first guy picked in 1954, 1956. Unfortunately for me, the Olympics were in Australia, and uh, it was summertime in Australia in November, and that's why the, uh, the Olympics were in November as opposed to the summer, say June or July, which would be in most other countries. Uh, the summer being, you know, yeah. uh, what it is here, uh, uh, but over there it's it's in our winter months, and long too long for me to wait. I was starving. I didn't have any money. Uh, the government didn't pay for you to get in shape to fight in the Olympics. So I turned pro uh, on April 23rd, 1956. Okay, so tell me about making that decision. Was that a tough decision to make? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's as easy as this. I'm broke. I, can't, I don't have any money. How am I going to get any money? Right. I can't get any money to train to stay alive. You know, because the government wasn't yeah. going to pay for it. They do now. They take yeah. care of the, the guys much better. And those guys that represent each division pretty well, I think. But what does it, uh, what does it entail, saying you turn pro, other than just saying, now I'm pro? You go get a manager? What do you do? Well, first of all, anybody can turn pro. Anybody can turn pro. You don't have to have a fight. You can turn right. pro. It isn't like in hockey or football, baseball, it's a team sports where you pretty well kind of uh, prove yourself. I mean, uh, you, you couldn't make the Toronto Maple Leafs or Montreal Canadiens team unless, unless you're a good hockey player, right. you know. And uh, so at that stage of my career, starting out, I fought everybody. I fought guys when I was 19 years old that Rocky Marciano wouldn't yeah. fight. I fought a guy called Bob Baker. It was my first loss. I, I almost knocked him up. I couldn't finish him. I, I, I got off the hook. But anyway, uh, I lost the decision to him. And uh, but I remember uh, Marciano wouldn't fight him. Yeah. My manager, unfortunately for me, was an older gentleman. He's well into his 80s. He didn't have much time, so he kind of rushed me a little bit. I don't. I don't mind being rushed if I have not proper training. But I, I, I can't expect to fight 
the fighters of that caliber yeah. were just a weak sparring. You know? well, what, uh, what, how long? One guy. Now, uh, when I, if I was in, in my later career, mm. I'd have guys, I'd have four or five guys come up from the States, whatever, I'd line them up, and I'd box maybe, uh, you know, 10 rounds a day a lot of yeah. times. I'd box 15, 16 rounds a day a, a few times. But generally, I, I, I thrived on hard work, I yeah. thrived on a lot of sparring, and I needed that. Yeah. I needed it for conditioning, I needed that for my own the confidence and to go into a fight knowing yeah. I was well prepared. You beat Yvonne Durrell, and he almost, he almost took the title away from Archie Moore, right? Yeah. Uh, he, how, uh, uh, how old were you when you fought him? Uh, I was remember? 22 then. Okay. Yeah. I was actually, I shouldn't have even fought the fight. Uh, I, I should have knocked him out a lot earlier. I knocked him out seven times. But I had to take my time because I had, I had a punctured eardrum okay. before the fight. And I shouldn't have fought the fight. If I was if I was smart, I wouldn't have fought in the, because I could have been deaf for life. I could have, if I got hit on the ear, I could have been deaf for life. I spoke to a doctor about it uh, the night before the fight. He says uh, uh, I have an ear infection because of the uh, ear puncture, and I, he gave me some penicillin, knocked the uh, infection away. But I said, if you get hit on your ear, you're allowed to be deaf for life. But I need the money, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I fought. So I, I but Ivan Durawas. Fighting him, I was like shooting fish in a pond. You know, he's a pretty easy guy to hit, but he's a very tough guy. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of ticker. And uh, I knocked him down seven times. The last knockdown was it. He, that's what they caught him out. Yeah. But uh, I'm gonna shoot, I should have knocked him out real quick. He, he was an old, well, older guy. He was 29. He wasn't that old, but I remember uh, he was complaining after the fight. He says, "Too old." He says, uh, "I'm." He says, uh, "He's he's 22, and I'm." Uh, he says, "I'm 30." Actually, he wasn't even 30. Yet. He was only 29. <laughs> But I, I guess I aged him one year after, after that <laughs> fight. You know. Tell me about the Floyd Patterson fight because that was that was an amazing uh, that had to have been an amazing experience for you. And I I'm, I gather that to this day, you and a lot of other people think that you should have won that fight well, in Madison Square Garden, right? Well, I thought I won the fight. A lot of guys thought I won the fight, yeah. but you know he's a New York guy, and I could not understand why they gave it to him. You know, he's, that's his hometown, and he's fighting. And you out came there. close. I mean, the judge, the judging was quite yeah, close, yeah, except for one. Close, yeah, right? it was pretty close. Yeah, I'm not sure. I forget what it was right now, but I know it was very close. It was six five and, and, and one. My problem in the fight, or after the fight, was he collapsed in the shower after the fight. He should have collapsed in the ring. <laughs> I'd been better off. <laughs> but, it was, but he it was a hard, tough fought fight. It was uh, picked the best fight of the year by Ring Magazine. And, yeah. In sixty five, uh, nineteen sixty five, yeah. yeah, it was a tough fight. Yeah. So. Tell me, tell me about your feelings of that because it's uh, it struck me, and people can actually go to the CBC website because the archive has the the program that that Telescope, the old CBC yeah. show, did about this, and it's riveting. Um, but I'm curious about how you felt about that because that was a that fight was a major deal. There was a lot of attention being paid yeah. to it in that documentary. They show your parents back here in yeah, Canada yeah. who didn't want you didn't want them there. They're hearing it on the radio. Yeah. They're hearing you getting pummeled in the head by Patterson. What was it like for you at well, the time? Do you remember it very well, I, clearly? I don't think I was getting pummeled much by. Well, but, that's but, how they were I, calling I, it. I, 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 that, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sure. But to me, I mean, Patterson was a hard puncher, I guess. But in the fight, for whatever reason, I didn't. It, it didn't it didn't impress me with his punching power yeah. in the fight, you know. But I primarily was he was moving a lot. He wasn't as aggressive with me as he was with other guys. He yeah. moved on me, which kind of surprised me quite a bit. He, yeah. I didn't expect him to move. I never saw him move with anybody. Uh, you know, he always walk in and pitch. And Wait, when you aggressive. say move like he was back and off, away. He, I move away. He yeah. was move away, and he did a pretty good job. I I, I was you know I was quite surprised when I saw him move because I didn't see him move with anybody. No matter who he fought, he always went after him, and that's the only fight I ever saw where he backed up. And he, but he fought a smart fight, and you know it was, it was a hard fought fight. Uh, I I was a little I went a little body crazy, a bunch of the body. That's what my trainer wanted to do it. Just go on the body, wear him down, and then go up to the head. But I was primarily a uh, body punches and uh, but he he took him quite well and like I said earlier he didn't collapse until he got into a shower <laughs> yeah. after the fight yeah. so, so a year later you're fighting Ali I want you to tell me this tell me how that came about because there's a story there well, you fight yeah. Ali here in Toronto in 1966 oh, yeah and, well, he was Cassius Clay then. Yeah. Uh, no, he but, was Ali then. Well, he had he just changed. Just, right? He just, just made changed. the change. He just yeah, made the just change. Because yeah. everybody, everybody was still calling him Cassius Clay. Well, he, the, he announced his conversion to Islam the night of the fight, uh, right after the fight with the Sonny Liston on right. February the 25th, 1964. But I didn't fight uh, uh, Ali until two years later. Right. Two years later. Okay, so tell me how that fight, that first fight with Ali came about, because it was an unexpected opportunity for you, right? Yeah. Well, I was supposed to fight him back in November, November uh, the 8th, uh, 1963. 
I fought a guy called Mike DeJohn. It was from Syracuse, but he was living in Miami at the time, and he, uh, they wanted they phoned me on my 26th birthday when I was living in Detroit. I was at the gym, and I got a call. Uh, and, uh, guys from New York wanted, who were involved with the with the uh, the uh, the fight network for the Friday night fights. Mm-hmm. Gillette Cavalcade of Sports, if you remember the, yeah, I do. the, the old yeah. time sponsors. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they phoned me up and said uh, Mike DeJohn pulled out of the fight with uh, excuse me. Ernie Terrell pulled out of the fight with Mike DeJohn. George, you want to fight uh, uh, Mike DeJohn in two weeks? Sure, I'll take the fight. Two weeks' notice, not too bad. So I get down. A week later, I, I come to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we came on, We came there on a Sunday. We were fighting the following Friday. On the next day, on a Monday, I go to a pre-fight weigh-in. So I'm there, and uh, Bill King, the promoter of the fight, comes over and says to me, George... Mike DeJohn uh, has signed uh, uh, to, f- uh, to fight Cassius Clay, as he was known then, yeah. if, if he wins the fight. Would you sign to fight Cassius Clay if you won the fight? I said, sure. And I saw, I saw Cassius. Uh, you were in his hometown, home. right? Yeah, it was, yeah, but he was at the, he was at the weigh-in. Uh, okay. He was dressed in a dark patterned blue suit, uh, excuse me, brown suit, and I, uh, white shirt, nice Brown tie with you know with design on it. It looked very clean cut, very well groomed. It looked like a, it looked like a, a, a you know a yuppie or like, like or, <laughs> yeah, or, right. or, a, or a preppy and yeah. just going to college. Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, and uh, so I remember thinking he's a nice looking kid. He looked you know he looked good. And uh, and uh, Bill King says, would you mind posing with Cassius because he's going to flex his muscles and Michael feel one arm and you can feel the other arm. And, and so I said, oh, yeah, that sounds okay, sounds cool. So anyway, we go, we go, and Cassius, as he was known then, comes over, starts posing. Like so I, Mike feels one muscle, I feel the other muscle. And I remember at the time, of course, he was a bit of a braggart. So I figured, I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this guy. So I'm feeling his bicep, and uh, he, we're all posing. They snap the picture. So I said, how you doing, uh, Popeye? He looks at me. How you doing, Popeye? He says, why you call me Popeye? I says, uh, <laughs> you remember Popeye? Oh, yes. Uh, I am uh, what I am. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, you must have some pretty big forearms, Popeye. He says, why are you saying that? Because you have awfully small biceps. Because remember Popeye had these huge forearms <laughs> with tattoos and little wee skinny biceps. Uh, so anyway, so Cassius uh, says, uh, well, that's the way Archie Moore talked that way. Alex Metiff talked that way. Uh, Willie Besmanoff talked that way. I said, yeah, 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 that's definitely not me. Anyway, that's just like that. No yeah. big deal. Anyway, after the fight, I don't know if you know what happened in the fight. I gave Mike DeJohn a bad beating. Yeah. I knocked him out twice to win a 10-round split decision. There were some forces against me in that fight. But anyway, I knock him out in the second round. I hooked the body, hooked the head. He drapes over the ropes, and I shot to pummel him. Bing, 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 bing. Like that. He slithers down the ropes, knocked out. They drag him back to the corner. And they announced that I lose the round for foul tactics. The, what was the foul tactic? As they announced it's in the paper, describing the paper, it says, I cross buttocked him. In other words, I was like, a, I gave him a hip check. Huh? Like I was a hockey player, a Canadian hockey player, no doubt. <laughs> so I said, well, what a joke. Anyway, I knocked him out. They dragged him back to the corner. They gave him a five minute rest. The fight resumes. I could, I could smell a rat, of course. I said, yes. So I said to my trainer, Teddy, as they dragged Mike back during that five minute, uh, a period, and I said, take off my gloves, I'm not fighting. Takes off one glove, takes off another glove, takes off the bandages and tape off my left hand. A little short, fat, white guy comes into the ring. His name is Bob Evans. He's the commissioner of the Kentucky uh, State Boxing Commission. Okay. He's the commissioner, head guy. He says, George, what you all doing? I said, uh, I'm taking the gloves off. I want to fight fair and square. I'm not fighting anymore. He said, y'all don't fight. Y'all don't get paid. I said, Teddy, put the gloves back on. <laughs> so I put the gloves back on. And now, but now I'm fighting without any bandages and tape on my left hand. So you just got the glove on now. Yeah, yeah okay. on my left hand. But I remember throwing a, a wide left hook at, over to the side, and I kind of tore my ligament right away in the first, in the, uh, in the first minute of action after right. the fight had resumed. Anyway, every time I threw a punch and I'd miss, oh, it would hurt. But if I landed, it was okay. Anyway, I let my arm hang down because it was, it, was, it was bothering me. Anyway, in the sixth round, he throws the right hand. I duck. I hit him with a perfectly timed left hook. Whack, right chin. Down he goes like he was shot. I didn't think he was going to get up. But he got up at the count of nine. He barely got up. 
I knock him down again. The referee walks over. Hard to believe this until you see it on television. Picks him up, dusts off his gloves, and then proceeds to give him a standing egg count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I was saying to myself, I think I'm in trouble this way. <laughs> anyway, he goes the distance. And every time was, you know, every time I get him caught in the corner, the referee will s- step in and, and try to you know, get, save the guy. Yeah. Anyway, anyway uh, the fight went the distance. The announcer decision, the referee votes a draw, but fortunately two, guy, the guys, two judges voted for me and I won the fight. Anyway, after the fight, Ali, or Cassius, as I was known, and then says in the paper, in the Louisville paper, I'm not fighting Chevalo. He fights rough and tough like a washerwoman. I didn't know what like a was. washerwoman? Yeah, I didn't know what he meant by that. So anyway, <laughs> it was only about 25 years later when I saw the fight. Because, you know, now you fight, you see your, you see your fight, everybody's got on and DVDs yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Like, but those days, it wasn't, that wasn't, it wasn't readily available. So when I got a hold of a, a film of the fight, a 16 millimeter, a guy in Detroit had yeah. it. And he showed me the fight, and then I started laughing. And I realized why Ali called me the washerwoman. So when I had Mike DeJohn over the ropes, he's six foot five, his lower back was over the top rope, and I had him over the ropes, and I was pummeling him like this, bang, 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 like doing the scrub board. So I said, that was pretty cute with the washerwoman. <laughs> anyway, he said, yeah, I don't want to fight Chihuahua. He fights rough and tough like a washerwoman. Besides, I don't even know where Canada is. I don't think uh, geography was a strong suit in high school. So. <laughs> but anyway, so if I don't fight him, I fight somebody else in my mind. So I don't, I don't care. It was no big deal. Yeah. What I didn't realize was, though, that at the t- that time, he had already signed to fight Sonny Liston a few months later on, on February the 25th, 1964. So why well, take a chance with a rough fight? Uh, I think he thought it'd be an easier fight uh, before he saw me fight the John. So, so they, I guess they decided not to fight. No big deal if I don't fight him. It's no big deal to me at the time. And then, when the time came to fight Ali, I well, actually what happened next was my fight with Ernie Terrell. Right. I fight Ernie Terrell. I thought I won the fight. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, going to the fight with my trainer, Teddy McWhorter, and with Irving Angerman. And it was kind of cute because at the time, Irving was to me, I was fighting the guys from Chicago. They were mob guys. And Irving it looked like, if you look at Irving's old pictures, it looks just like Jack Ruby. The, the, Actually, you're right, he does. Uh, he he does it, yes. uh, very much so. I dressed the same way. He looked like <laughs> a Chicago mobster himself. Anyway, we go into the car uh, from the Seaway Towers on the Lakeshore Road down by Windermere, and I would drive along on a bitter cold November one day, November 165, and Irving is looking out at the breakwater, all of a sudden, smash, hits the dash. He hits it a few more times, I say, what the hell's the matter with you? He said, I'm nervous. I said, you're nervous? I'm supposed to be nervous, <laughs> not you. Anyway, he must have hit it 25 times if he hit it once on the way to the guard. So after, anyway, after the fight, I thought I won the fight. Ernie Trell and I... Uh, was a, a fight that I, that I don't like watching too much. It was just a terrible fight. Yeah. All he did was run, 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 and he beat the hell out of my right hand out here. I think if I, had, if I dropped my right hand and didn't even hold it up by my face, and he threw it, he would have thrown it far enough to hit me anyway. All he wanted to do was throw a jam and get the hell out of there. Get out of there. Anyway, after the fight, they give, uh, everybody's in my corner, all, those, all the media, the photographers, the, the sports writers, fight fans, everybody's in my corner. Nobody's in... Uh, Ernie Terrell's corner, but his manager and trainer looks like he's going to die of loneliness. Big, tall, skinny guy, and uh, he looks more like a basketball player than a, than a fighter. But anyway, uh, uh, the decision is rendered. They give him the fight. So I'm a little upset, more than a little upset. And anyway, after the fight in the dressing room, I say to Irving, Irving, why were you so nervous before the fight? He says, I was threatened. I said, who threatened you? He says, Bernie Glickman, the front man for Tony Accardo. Tony Accardo was a big mob boss in Chicago, and he was the real manager of Ernie Terrell. But because he had a criminal record, a rather lengthy criminal record, he couldn't, he couldn't manage he couldn't, yeah. uh, uh, at least not on paper. Yeah. So on paper, it was Bernie Glickman. And guess who was his partner or were coming into the, in, in, in from Chicago? The Chicago police chief. <laughs> I remember pretty tight with the, with the Chicago police chief. That was, it was funny. Okay. I, I was I, 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 I got a kick out of that. Anyway, but he came over to Irving apparently and threatened Irving. And I said, how did he threaten you? He said, he said to me, if Shabala wins the fight, 
you're going to end up in a cement box of Lake Ontario. So when we were passing Lake Ontario on the way to the gardens, <laughs> he imagined himself at the bottom of the lake. That's where he, he started like hitting the, the dash? Yeah, that's where he started <laughs> whacking the dash. Anyway, now, since Terrell got the decision, they, they want to make a unification of the heavyweight titles. Terrell, the WBA World Boxing Association champion, and Muhammad Ali, the WBC champ, World right. Boxing Council. So they want to put the fight together. But they can't do it in the United States. Not one commission would sanction that fight, mainly because Muhammad Ali refused to go to Vietnam to right. fight for his right. country. Yeah. He said, I got no call to Viet Cong. That's it. Yeah. He's not fighting. And, uh, and uh, the... It's hard to believe it today, when you say it today, because today he's probably the most revered guy on earth. A lot of people would say that, the most revered person on earth. But in those days, he was a social pariah. Yeah, because he did of, that. Oh, yeah. A lot of people yeah. said he should fight yeah. for his country, no matter what. Yeah. Today, a lot of people say he was right. But in, in those days, back in the 60s, uh, a lot of people didn't say that. A lot of people had their relatives fighting in the war, maybe fathers, yeah. maybe uh, brothers, maybe friends, or cousins, whatever. Uh, and They didn't take too kindly to him not wanting to fight in the war. So the fight was literally chased out of the United States and taken to Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Seventeen days before the fight, uh, I was exactly 28 and a half, and, the, and I got a call at my manager's office. Uh, at Irving Eigenman's office, and it was from Mike Mallitz, uh, who was promoting the fight, one of the promoters of the fight, along with Bob Arum, by the way. And uh, that was his first fight he was supposed to, okay. to, to, to deal with. But anyway, it ended up being my fight with uh, Ali because they asked me if I would fight Muhammad. And I said, sure. But I said to Mike Mallitz, sure, I'll fight Muhammad, but just I have to wait for a minute. I have to see what we're doing that night. Let me phone my wife. Hang on to the phone. I'll be right back. So I phoned my wife. I said, Lenny, honey, what are we doing in 17 days on the 29th of this month? She says, nothing, why? And I said, well, you're going to the fights. Who's fighting me? Who are you fighting? Muhammad Ali. I said, so she started laughing. I thought I was four around. No, no, the fight's on. And so I got back on the other line. I said, uh, Mike, it's okay. We're not doing anything special that night. We're not going to the movies or anything, so the fight's on. So I fight Muhammad Ali. And at that time, uh, when I compared to other fights that Ali was involved in, uh, it was a lot different. It was a different feel. I think for uh, for the average fight fan watching it. First of all, when he came up here, though, it was a lot different than being in the States. People loved him up here. Yeah. He loved Canada. He thought he it was, did. He was well received. Yeah. And, I think uh, he was surprised by that. He was quite surprised, yeah. and he was and he's pretty happy about it. Yeah. And, but it still was a somber time because he was still facing jail time. He was yeah. facing jail time yeah. and uh, for refusing to go into the draft. Yeah. That was a very somber time. And uh, you had Joe Lewis in your corner. Well, he wasn't in my corner. Well, he was, he, in the, he was, he in was my with camp. you. He was in he your was camp. In my camp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And just like it, it's it's like window dressing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Joe Joe was a nice guy and, and 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 he was a great fighter, but it was just window dressing. It was yeah. just Joe Lewis and George Cat, big deal. You know, I, I shouldn't say big deal. It sounds like I'm sledding Joe. Joe's a great fighter yeah. and a real nice guy, but it was. It didn't it, change anything. No, it didn't no. change anything. No, no. I want to ask you about your relationship with Ali. You fought him again in 72. Right. But, yeah, and you had that experience that you just talked about early on in Louisville right. in his yeah. hometown. What was, just personally between the two, outside of, the, of all of the showmanship that he put on, all the blather that he uh, put on and everything, was he a decent guy to you when the two yeah, of you were? Yeah, he was, he was very nice with me. We're, you know, we're both you know, very gentlemanly with each other. Just, you know, how you doing, nice to see you. you know, yeah, it, was, it was nice. As a matter of fact, I, I've only seen him a few times. I've seen him, I saw him a few times, like I saw him before the fight with uh, Sonny Liston. Right. Uh, the one was supposed to take place in Boston, but uh, but Liston got a cut eye. The fight was postponed. They took it to Lewiston, Maine. But I'd see, I'd see Muhammad around a few little places. How you doing? Nice to see you. How are you? Give him a little hug, or whatever. Give me a little hug. You know, yeah. you know, like we're like yeah. we're friends. You know. Anyway, I I uh, I saw him the last time in, on October the twentieth. 2002 at the Rogers Center, or, or Sky Dome as it was called then, right. uh, at a football game, Toronto Argonauts versus Ottawa Renegades, uh, sponsored by Coca-Cola, uh, a fundraiser for Parkinson's disease yeah. or syndrome, which Ali is afflicted with apparently. Anyway, yes. we were all there, and they had a little press conference uh, in the hotel in the Sky Dome, and uh, I remember the last thing he said to me, people snapping pictures all over the place, McLean's Magazine took a picture, snap. And I had, had a picture of him touching my head, and he said to me in a, in a barely audible whisper, Hey, man, 
you got some pretty hair. <laughs> That's the last thing he said to me. Why did you get the fight? Well, I got the fight because Ernie Trell pulled out. And why did Ernie Trell pull out of the fight? Why did Ernie Trell pull out of the fight? Well, I'll tell you why. Tell me why. I know that when I got the call to fight Muhammad Ali, I knew or I could locate Bernie Glickman, the guy who threatened my manager. Okay. I just had to phone all the hospitals in uh, Chicago, and I would have found him in one of them. Because he's, I don't know the name of the hospital, but if, if I worked diligently, I would have found uh, would have found him because he was in the hospital, beaten within an inch of his life, within an inch of his life. So all I got to do is use my imagination a little bit. I say, well, how would that happen? Before the fight, my supposed fight with, uh, well, the fight that did take place with Bernie Terrell, Bernie Glickman was in my manager's office, threatening him, you know, threatening him yeah. very severely. Uh, 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 that if I won the fight, he'd, up, he'd ended up in a cement box at the bottom of Lake Ontario. I can only imagine what happened to land Bernie Glickman in a Chicago hospital, where incidentally he was interrogated by the police and wouldn't give out names. Anyway, uh, from the hospital, by the way, he went right into a mental institution two, three weeks later, never saw the light of day again. Never saw the light of day again. He died in a mental institution. So how did that happen? Well, I figured, I figured this way. I think this is a pretty good bet. Hi, Herbert Muhammad, manager of, of uh, Muhammad Ali, son of Elijah Muhammad, uh, the uh, number one, uh, uh, okay. I guess, potentate, whatever yeah, okay. you want to say that, in, 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 the, in the black yes, Muslim Black Muslim America. nation, yes, indeed. Yeah, he was head of the, of, of the uh, Islamic nation. And uh, uh, I can only imagine what happened. If, if he walked into Irving Angleman's office, I figured he'll, he, he, and nothing happened to him, he might as well walk into Herbert Muhammad's office and do a little bit of threatening, nothing will ever happen to him. Besides, you got Tony Ricardo behind him, right? <laughs> That's right. But uh, I don't think the black Muslims are too worried about mafioso, I don't think. <laughs> anyway, he goes into the office the way I saw it, gave the same, same threat as he gave Irving Angerman, like uh, if Muhammad Ali wins the fight, you're going to end up in a cement box in Lake Michigan. Just change the venue, like Lake Ontario to Lake Michigan. And all Herbert Muhammad had to do was go like this. With, the, with this fruit of Islam guards. And it all goes it. away. That's a, and then just leave it to your imagination. Next thing you know... You're uh, fighting Muhammad Ali. <laughs> yeah, I'm fighting Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and uh, Ernie Trell's manager of record is in the hospital. Weeks away from, from his demise, where he died. He died, just, he died a few weeks later, or a few months later. He never saw the light of day again. Went right to a mental institution, and that was it for him. You know, this boxing thing... <clears throat> Has some dimensions to it. It's that, rougher uh, than polo. It's <laughs> <laughs> R- rougher than polo. Yeah. All right, George. I want to talk to you about the other part of your life that that uh, has now uh, occupied you uh, right up to the moment that we're sitting here. Um, the and I think most people probably know about this. And I and I know it's rough that you go through this over and over again. I know that your son Mitch has said that he he could never relive what you relive so regularly. But he says you have a gift for being able to put images uh, into words for young people. Um, so I have to ask you about it, and, I'm, and I hope you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, your youngest son, Jesse, was involved in a, in a motorcycle accident, I understand, Correct. in which the injuries were such that the pain was almost unbearable for him. Well, is, that what, is that what turned well, him the, to heroin? The, well, the pain, uh, first of all, the kneecap was torn off. They reattached the kneecap to the knee at the hospital by taking out muscle area from his left thigh and reconnecting tendons and ligaments. They put my son on a very heavy narcotic called Demerol for seven mm-hmm. days. Anyway, they took him off Demerol after just, just one week, then they put him on Tylenol 3. Tylenol 3. My son complained to me about the pain. He said, I'm in pain. He says, Tylenol 3 is doing nothing for me. I was, so I spoke to his doctor. His doctor said, uh, that he was fearful of habituation. He didn't want my son to get hooked on Demerol. He said, uh, he says, that's why I put him on time now, three now for two or three weeks. Don't worry about Jesse. Jesse will be just fine. My son wasn't just fine. Went to a party one night, East End of Toronto. 
complained to someone there about the pain in his leg, and a particular someone said he had something for my son's pain. And that was uh, Jesse's introduction to heroin. Mm -hmm. That was in May of 1984. And uh, by the time September of 1984 rolled around, before I found out I had one heroin addict, I had three of them. So it was quite a, it was quite a shock. But somehow I thought, I don't know, you think somehow that they can shake it, that they can beat it, somehow, hopefully they can find the strength somehow to conquer it. But you don't really realize what a hold heroin mm -hmm. has on a person till you see it with your own eyes, till you see it in your own family, when you see it with your own, with your own flesh and blood. It's, you know, when you, that, that stuff is so powerful. That stuff is like so mind-bending. That, that stuff is like, like, like the worst thing on earth that could ever happen when you become an addict. The worst thing that you ever heard that becoming a heroin addict, to me. Anyway, the way I saw it. I, I saw my son so many times in hospital having their stomachs pumped and doctors literally kicking them out of emergency. Get them out of here. Because when you're a, a drug addict back in the 80s, You're on the lowest rung of the social ladder. You're a you're a scum, and they don't want to. The doctors didn't want to hear. They don't want to hear any sob stories. Just get them out of here. Mm -hmm. And I would beg for them to form my sons to let them stay in psychiatric care for 30 days and hope they'd be sent into rehab. But it wouldn't happen. Uh, my sons would go out and overdose time and time again. My son seen him overdose 15 times in two months. 15 times in two months. He overdosed three times in a day and a half, once even in a police station. Kick him out, take him to the hospital. The hospital, they give him the boat, get him out of here. OD'd in a police station? Part, OD'd, OD'd in the police, police station? Yes, yes. Jesus. I'm pretty, pretty where, were they getting the, where were they getting the money for this, do you know? Well, they were they steal? They, they were stealing. Drugstores. I remember, I remember, I talked to kids about this. I, said, some, I don't say this, tell the story all the time, but I remember I left the house one morning, I had to go to Hamilton, do a real estate transaction. Anyway, I left my guys at home. Jesse had passed away at this time, but then I, it was George Lee and Stephen. So I go to Hamilton, I do my business in Hamilton, I'm on the road back to Toronto about one o'clock, and I got the radio on, and I have the one o'clock news on, and I hear my name. The sons of former Canadian heavyweight boxing champion George Chevalo, George Lee Chevalo, and Stephen Louis Chevalo were apprehended and arrested by police earlier this morning after robbing Armour Chemists, a drugstore at the corner of 401 Highway and Islington Avenue. You hear this on the radio? I heard it on the radio. I'm driving the car. I almost fell off the road. I'm, holy Mac, what's up? Oh, oh, what happened? Oh my God! I'm, I'm, I'm driving the car. I'm, oh, I'm like, like, and, and I'm like, I'm, like, I'm kind of numb, and, I'm, and yet I'm. I, I see, I, I'm moving my body, I'm, the car is moving, I'm moving, and I'm turning the car this way, that way, I'm like, holy mackerel. I, 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 it's a wonder I didn't go flying off the road. It's a wonder I, I didn't go flying off the road. Anyway, what happened was my sons had, uh, I had left to go to Hamilton. My sons woke up. They needed, some, they needed a fix. They didn't have the money for a fix. So they walked about a mile Maybe not, not quite that far, about half a mile to a drugstore. It's at the corner. It was in a little plaza. Apparently they went in. To the, to, they walked over to the drugstore. One son had a butcher knife. The other one had a hatchet. They walked into the drugstore and took the, took the uh, hatchet, smashed it on the counter, demanding drugs. The other son took a knife and he branched it in the air, demanding drugs. They got the drugs. They filled the bag with drugs and they fled the premises. They went over a bridge along and alongside the Humber River, which which goes through uh, through Toronto into Lake Ontario. Right. Anyway, they ran in an easterly uh, fashion over to uh, over to uh, Western Road. The police were alerted and they were chasing them, but they outran the police. They ran with the gym bag and they got to Western Road, and uh, they eluded the police. But I don't know where the police were at that time when they got to Western Road. But anyway, they had no money. They wanted drugs. They wanted so they. They made a, a, a trade with some uh, TTC passengers for tickets and for some money to buy some bottled water so they could swallow the pills. So that's what they did. And they, there's a, there was a convenience store nearby. They got some bottled water. They went back into the they went into the bus 
and then went about three or four stops, all the while the, the thorn pills down their mouths, and they went a few stops anyway, I don't know exactly, but then they, they got off the bus, one son got off the bus, and he flopped comatose, <laughs> out like a light. His brother followed suit, <laughs> out like a light, top of his brother's back. And that's how the police eventually found my sons, because the police were alerted, and one son was neatly stacked on top of the other, and that's how they were taken into court, and that's how they were sent to jail, to a federal penitentiary, yeah. For robbing a dark store. Did Robbie's did store. did the did Jesse's suicide have an impact on them? Was there a period of time after his death where the other two boys well, they, might have flirted with the idea of trying to trying to kick it? Of trying to kick it, the habit. Did uh, it have that they, kind they, of? They, they never talked to me about that. No? I, it's I, it's kind of crazy to me that whole time period. Now is so. Crazy. I don't remember how, how I talked to him. I don't remember was like the, that that time period in my life. That was the worst, one of the worst things that ever happened to me when I first found out about my first son dying. That was like that was like um, an unbelievable shock. You're numb, and I couldn't I couldn't help my sons. Not never mind myself. I couldn't help myself. Never mind my sons. I couldn't help myself. I mean, I, I was. I remember people coming over uh, through the uh, through the. Through the Justice system. I guess they they sent some people over. They, they uh, he, his son uh, he lost his son, and the, and the lady had lost a daughter uh, in a car accident. So they helped me deal with my grief. They were they were quite nice. You know, uh, they were helpful, and I appreciate them coming and taking the time, caring enough to come and see me and try to help me out. But I remember after after like about a month or two, I'm trying to. I don't know, my kids are running all over the place. They're, they're getting high, they're, they're getting stoned, they're, they're back in the hospital and all so on. That's, that's the way, you know, that's the way, um, that's what was happening. And uh, uh, that's went on for a few months. And, and I was like, in, I was in a, like in a daze. I didn't know, I didn't know. And when mm -hmm. you, lose a, you lose a child, worst thing, but it's the worst thing. You, you're, you're like numb, you can't, your life isn't worth living. You're, you're, you're like, you're like half dead. But of, course, but of course, as I say that, as I say that, I also realized that, uh, I remember at the time I had two little grandchildren, you know, my, my son Stephen's two children, and I said, somebody's got to be strong for them, so it's that helped me kind of stay on my feet a little bit. But I remember as far as helping my sons, George and Stephen, I was, a, I was useless. I was useless. And your wife, not, not your wife at the time said, after after Jesse was gone, she said she couldn't stand to lose another if, child. If, if another one goes, she's gone. And she didn't have to tell me that. I knew that would happen anyway. If my wife lost another child, if we lost another child, I know my wife would be able to, wouldn't be there. She wouldn't she wouldn't be buying around. No, impossible. And uh, and then when uh, when my Second son died. A few years later, he just come out of jail. First of all, Jesse died nine months after becoming an addict. Yeah. He shot himself. He. I, I, I saw it unfold in front of my eyes about him going, being going to die. I, in a way, I knew I knew he was going to die. You know, sometimes people say they're going to die, and you don't really believe them. My son talked to me about it. He's talked, he mentioned, he said he's going to kill himself. I said, what are you talking about? You're going to kill yourself. You know, talk, kill yourself. You're not going to kill yourself. You know. <laughs> not going to kill yourself. Yeah. Not going to kill yourself. Oh, yeah. People often say that. They're going to kill themselves. And they don't do anything about it. Yeah. But, but there are a lot of people who do say they're going to kill themselves and do kill themselves. But anyway, I was, I was too messed up to really help myself. I was, I was, I was so messed up with thinking about, you know, uh, all the kids are all, they're all, three of them are messed up, and I, I, and I, I didn't think he was going to mess, I didn't think he was going to do that. I yeah. just found that out. I was in the flush of that, the, the, the initial reaction, when, you know, which uh, in the first two, three months of so realizing it all, it's like, it throws you for a loop. It yes. did for me anyway. I was, I was so upset. I didn't, know what, I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know where to turn for help. I didn't know anything. I was, I was just too messed up. Anyway, when my son dies in February of 1985, my other two guys go deeper and deeper in, into the drugs, deeper and deeper, and doing crazy things, trying to trying to rob drugstores and and, and robbing drugstores, and uh, and I guess taking stuff from the house. Who knows what they did? I have no idea. Uh, you know, th things go missing. You say, well, 
you don't like to think the worst that way, but when you're, but desperate people do desperate things, you know, and when you're desperate for drugs, you do anything. You see beautiful young girls become hookers after you get into the habit. Beautiful young girls who are, who are, who have no business doing that kind of, you know, yeah. but because of the drug, they'll do anything, yeah. do anything to get the drug. Anyway, my sons rob, would rob drugstores. They would rob drugstores and do whatever else they had to do to get money for the drug. Anyway, when I tell that story about uh, when after Jesse dies, my sons um, got involved with drugs and mm-hmm. you know worse than ever. And then when they went to jail for two years, let's see, how would they come out? They went to jail in 1986 or 1986. Yeah, 1986, and they come out a couple of years later. And uh, my son, one son came out earlier. I think Stephen came out earlier. Georgie came out a little later, and uh, he came out on October 31st, 1993. Actually, I'm, I'm wrong. He, that's when he did come out. But he already did time before that. Okay. He was arrested a few more times and to come out. But the last time he. He did a stretch. It was for, for a couple of years, and he came out October uh, 31, 1993, on Halloween, and uh, they found his body at the Gladstone Hotel uh, at 12 o'clock noon. They had phoned him earlier to say to that you know he's got to leave at 12. You're supposed to leave at 12 o'clock or at 11 o'clock, whatever. Anyway, they had called him at 12, but no answer. And uh, finally. Uh, the police were called. I guess Orkley, the cleaning lady, went into the room and saw the body. Police were called. They found my son dressed in a pair of undershorts, syringe sticking out of his left arm. This is how long after he'd been out of prison? Pardon? How long after he'd been out of prison? Four days. Four days. Come out October 27th. Four days later, October 31, they found his body at the Gladstone Hotel. Four days. Yeah, four days. He couldn't wait to get back on the drugs. He just couldn't wait. You know, if at the best of times, it's hard to shake the habit. But if things aren't going well for you, if you don't see a healthy future for yourself, I guess things, you know, it's easy to get, fall back yeah. on the habit. It's easy to get messed up. I may used to walk into a, my son used to tell me, Steve would tell me they'd walk into, a, uh, into the Parkdale Hotel they see the dealer at the bar, and, and as soon as the dealer would show him the smack in his hand, the white stuff in the, hand, in the palm of his hand, they'd crap their pants. They'd defecate in their drawers before they even dealt the money. As soon as they saw the drug, you know, so I said to myself, well, it must take, but that must be one hell of a feeling, you know, that must be, what a horrible thing to fight. And I said to myself, what could make me crap my drawers at the very sight of yeah. seeing the, the object of my desire within the flash of one second. What could, what could do that? Nothing. I couldn't think of anything. Yeah. Not even close. But that shows you what kind of a yeah. grip drugs yeah. can have, what kind of a grip yeah. it had on my sons. Yeah. You and Stephen, he went back into prison, and when he was back in prison in the 90s, it looked for a while there like he was coming around. You talked to him about going and talking to kids in schools, right? I talked to him about that. I thought he would do a good job. I thought he would do a great job that way. I think, you know, you know uh, me as the parent of an auditor addict, so my son as the addict, and uh, I thought we were done well together. He was all excited by it. But, you know, remember, when you're an addict, things aren't always rosy in your life. Just because you stop doing drugs doesn't mean everything else is okay. Uh, his wife divorced him a couple of weeks before he came out of jail. Not that I blame her. I mean, really, mm. he wasn't much of a husband in the last few years of their marriage. He wasn't much of a husband. You know, he, uh, when he was with his kids, he, he, he was very nice with them. But when you're an addict, you're not around most of the time. You know, you're not around even when you're outside of jail. Plus, when you're in jail for, for most of your married life, you don't see your kids all the time. Uh, and when he came out... Uh, when he was straight, he was he was terrific with them. He was wonderful with them. But then when he was using, he's out of sight. Yeah. So you know, it's it's hard. It's hard. And I know my grandson and my granddaughter love their father. I have, thank God for for uh, 
for video. Thank God for videotapes. I have some stuff with him and the kids, and he was, you could see, uh, you, you look at him, you say, hey, you're going to get the, must, uh, I can, uh, I can nom 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 nominate this guy for the Father of the Year Award. I mean, he looked like a terrific father. Taking him to the places, to give him ice cream, take him for walks, take him to the parks, and take him to play uh, hockey, take him to play uh, baseball, whatever, you know. Uh, taking his daughter to soccer, watching her play soccer, whatever, any of those things. They got all kinds of nice video on it, and it's, very, it's, and it's nice to see. Nice to see ha a happy time in his life with his kids. But, I, but my kids, my grandchildren went through a lot. They, they suffered a lot. Hard to lose a parent like that. Hard yeah. to lose a parent like that. Yeah. You know, sort of in your life. It's hard. And, uh, it, and everybody feels that, that pain, everybody in the family. You know, when you die, it's like when my son died, it isn't just that he died. My son also, because he died, could have had p possibly other gra children, other grandchildren like mm -hmm. I had. So I didn't just lose a son. My grandchildren just didn't lose a father. They also lost other siblings. I think it's hard for most people to imagine what, what that must have been like for you. I, I, th I, I think that, that the vast majority of people would have no concept of what that feeling must have been like for you. And I think that a lot of people would be would expect that that would that the loss of three of your five children and your wife under those horrible circumstances would have sent you off the deep end uh, well, but it didn't uh, well I, was, I, <laughs> I wasn't the easiest person to be with not so much with my friends with my future wife whom I started to see a couple of months after my son died I started to see just as a friend that she was like my wife's colleague. I remember her coming to our house after she lost a daughter to SIDS and uh, and I saw her after my wife's funeral and I just see her around. Anyway, I don't know how it happened. Where one day we're having a coffee. Next thing you know, I'm having a coffee almost every day with her. Next thing you know, I'm married. It seemed like that. Yeah. Anyway. But when, you say you weren't, but when you say you weren't an easy person to get along with, what were you like? Uh, I would. Uh, Did you I go would, inside I'd yourself? Explode. I would explode. Okay. I'd explode. I'd explode. You know what I mean? I'd explode. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty calm guy most of the time. I'm pretty relaxed. But I would. I go. I go. I go temporarily insane. Yeah. Then I come back. I'd be, I'd be kind of normal. I, I wasn't easy to be with. I don't know how my. I don't know how my future wife put up with me. I don't know how. You know, but she could calm me down, and she was good for me that way. And. And uh, she's good for me today. And I, and uh, if I'm as, if I'm as healthy as I can be mentally, or emotionally, it's a lot to do with, with her, her and I being okay together. Tell me about going to schools then. Tell me about going to, out to schools and talking to kids. That's what you talked to Stephen about about going and talking to kids. And you started doing it right after I he died, doing right? It, I started doing it on September the sixteenth, nineteen ninety-six. My son died. In August of 1996, died August 17th, and uh, they found him on the 18th. But I think he died the day before. Mm -hmm. so okay. That's why I say it's 17th. But anyway, uh, my son uh, and I had talked about going around the country because I'd spoken to a charity. They had at first expressed a desire that they wanted to send me around the country with my son. And I started to, uh, thinking to myself, I say that's a pretty good idea. Like I said earlier, my son is the addict, and he's the parent of an addict or addict. So I went to see him in jail at uh, uh, Ontario Correctional Institute in Brampton, mm -hmm. uh, where, where he was doing a stretch, two years less than a day, and where he had left uh, and come out on uh, October the 6th, and he died uh, 11 days later, right. October 17th. Anyway... He thought it would be a great idea. My son was going to talk to young people about education, how important education is to young people. My son was going to talk to young people about simple act of smoking, that's what I talk about, yeah. um, and the correlation between smoking and drugs sometimes. And talk to him about love of family, talk about a whole bunch of different topics. You know? And uh, I always say to young people, Stephen's not here, but in the next few minutes I'm going to talk to you about the echoes of my son's mind about the things I knew he was going to talk about yeah. and about the simple things. You know, it's, it's kind of 
It's kind of funny, you know, about education. You see these kids killing each other on the streets today, kids involved in dope, and, and usually there's always a couple of common denominators. One, usually most of them, most of them uh, are all high school dropouts. Uh, a lot of them smoke, not necessarily all of them, but I, I, I find a, a tremendous amount of smoking with young people today, and I, I'm always amazed at why or how someone could smoke today given all the negative negativity yes. uh, in terms of advertising. Yeah. And, uh, and the evidence. Uh, evidence. Yeah. Uh, uh, all kinds of people. A lot of us have lost people, friends, people in yeah. families to smoking. And when you see the the stern warnings on a cigarette package from Health Canada, you know what I mean? It tells you right there. I always tell kids, I've, if those same stern warnings are Campbell's tomato soup, and the labels on the canned tomato soup would say something like this, eating or drinking this canned tomato soup could cause cancer, could cause heart attack, strokes, emphysema, lung disease. Put it over Smoking there. T- yeah. Eating this canned tomato soup can kill you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 But that's what it says on every cigarette package if you smoke. It causes all those things. So. so talking to these kids at the beginning, when you first started yeah. doing it, yeah. did, that, did that help you get through all of that? Was that, was well, that part it, of it, or was it, it, it really hard it, to do? It, I kind of rambled a little bit when I first started speaking. It's a little tighter. It's a little tighter presentation today, I think. And uh, but I look at it this way: because my kids died and my wife died, perhaps because of what happened to them, they can help other people. Yeah. Because they died, they can help other people make intelligent decisions at the most important time of their lives. And I always talk about the most important time of your life being as a young person, because it's when you're young that you make decisions that essentially affect you for the rest of your life. You know, so. When you, uh, when you think about education, if you do well in school, you got to feel kind of good about yourself. You should be happy if you do well in school. Because when you're younger and when you're young, and if you're 15, 16, you're doing well in school, you see a bountiful future for yourself and your future family. In your, in your natural mind, that's what you see. You see a bountiful future. You've got to feel kind of good about yourself. But if you don't do well in school, you don't see a bountiful future, you see a bleak future for yourself. And, you know, and you're not deaf, dumb, and blind at 15 or 16. You can see a bleak future, a bleak future, and it doesn't bode well for a young person. Easier to get pulled off track. The happier you are, the tougher it is to get pulled off track. The unhappier you are, the easier it is to get pulled off track. I think that's just common sense. We'll put, we'll put on the screen over our credits, we'll put up on the screen how people can get to your website yeah, about that stuff. Uh, I want to thank you for doing this, George. Uh, it has well, been an honor. Me. It thank has you. been an honor. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Nice to see you. Appreciate it. Uh, it was a nice, uh, nice little chat. <laughs> 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 nice little chat.